This is your home for St. Cloud State Hockey, keeping you up to date on the NCHC. One-timer coming, they score! Ripped in! A bomb from Perfect! Women's WCHA. So Dana Rasmussen fires and she scores! Dana Rasmussen for the Huskies. The National Hockey League. Dwayne Kaprizov in for a chance to win it! He scores! And everything from the state of hockey. St. Cloud Cathedral is now 42.6 seconds away from wrapping up the school's first ever title. Welcome to the Huskies Warming House Podcast Den. Welcome in to episode number 107 here on the Huskies Warming House Podcast. I'm Noah Grant alongside Nick Maxson, and we will be joined by a special guest that's going to be talking all things St. Cloud State Hockey, Transfer Portal News, and everything around the college and NHL landscape in the main portion of the show. Uh, what does that include? We're going to talk, obviously, some NHL Minnesota Wild stuff, as well as some scenarios that have gone around in the league over the past 10 days or so. Frozen Four, of course, we're going to recap some of that, and then our extra ice session, as we alluded to, all things St. Cloud State. It's going to be a long show. You're going to love it, and if you don't love it, well, why are you here? Um, besides to see Nick Maxson's beautiful face, as always. It's not, no. No. I I think no. It's, well, no. No, don't lie. Uh, don't I lie. I actually don't come here for the hockey. I'm here for you. You know that, right? No, I don't. <laughs> That's anyway, why. that's why for those who are um, very concerned and gagging at the bromance, we'll head on over as always. gagging at my face is really what it is. <laughs> is that is that like a like a new like bedroom move? Anyway, OK, center ice view news and notes in the Huskies Illustrated Weekly Roundup. We're going to head over right now. Center ice view news and notes. Center ice view provides you with the best coverage of St. Cloud State Huskies hockey from game notes, recaps, photos and more. Go to centericeview.com. illustrated weekly roundup noah and it is uh, exodus season as they say in college hockey and we'll start with the michigan wolverines after they lose in the semifinals uh plenty of top prospects leaving the program uh number one overall pick owen power signing his entry level deal with the buffalo sabers uh and then number two pick maddie bernier signing his entry level deal um with the seattle crack and that won't begin until next season um, and then Columbus also nabbing their fifth overall pick in Kent Johnson. Uh, how about that scary line? Kent Johnson, Matt Braniers, and it was uh, uh, Brandon Brisson, right? So yeah. two of their three top guys uh, out of the way, right? So also uh, D-man Nick Blackenberg also heading to Columbus on his entry-level deal as well. Um, moving things more closer to the NCHC, Hobie Baker finalist Bobby Brink signing his deal with the Philadelphia Flyers uh, three years in his contract. Um, and then uh, also, was it Tuesday? Uh, so tomorrow, uh, I should say the 12th, for those who are listening a little bit later in the week, he has been uh, also said that he will be making his pro debut, according to head coach, let me rephrase that. Interim head coach, Mike Hill. Uh, Minnesota State's Nathan Smith, unfortunately, after falling in the national championship game, has signed his entry-level deal with the Arizona Coyotes, or should we say the Houston Oilers or whatever they're going to be in the next year. Um, it's it's not going to be Arizona for a while. Um, Ohio State's Georgie McCurloff signing with the uh, Boston Bruins, and after his freshman season, so only one year of college hockey for him. And then Blake McLaughlin uh, of the Gophers also signing his deal with Anaheim. Uh, how about this? How about some current NHL players who are either uh, making extensions or early? How about this? Colorado's Curtis McDermott, former Los Angeles King, um, getting a two-year extension with the Avalanche. Also, Bowen Byram coming back on defense. There are 37-game absence after a concussion sidelined him for a majority of the season. Uh, but how about this? I, I think, you know, as we, we talk about hockey and we try to talk about how the league is really trying to get the head injuries out of the game. This is from a 20 year old player. Um, I'd rather be playing again and be at risk than be in the stands watching every game. Yeah. It's scary. Uh, I think yeah. from that perspective, and I know Bowen really wants to play and, you know, they've got a great team obviously in Colorado, but you know, it, it kind of sounds like the decision 
Uh, even even head coach Jared Bednar had talked about, you know, oh, we're going to keep our fingers crossed on this. That's not something you want to hear from a fourth overall pick that's kind of supposed to be your future at only 20 years old. No, and, and it goes back to that old school hockey mentality, which is I can play through anything. I'm, I'm big, I'm tough. But again, head injuries and, and more so concussions, again, being a, a bigger focus, especially from, uh, I should say, the players and the Players yeah. Association and their agents. But uh, again, the NHL in terms of their stance, again, still very much in a, probably the wrong side of the argument as and you go from that. It, it's it's one thing if he's 36 and he's making his last cup run, you know, at the tail end of a contract and he's going to take a chance on it. I, I understand that. But at 20 years old, you got to take care of your body, man, if he wants to have a long career. 100%. Uh, speaking of long careers, uh, how about this? San Jose's GM Doug Wilson stepping down after 19 seasons at the helm of the San Jose Sharks. Uh, it, it didn't really say why, although I think the perception is he's been battling some medical issues. He's actually been away from the organization for some months. Uh, mm -hmm. Assistant GM Joe Will, who actually um, is a Bloomington native, actually, so a Minnesota yeah. native, uh, has been uh, sort of been you know, playing interim GM role uh, is since that time. So likely it is probably due to the medical conditions, although we don't know for sure. Um, took over the Sharks in 2003. Uh, and during his time, 14 playoff first out of his 19 seasons, five division titles, only one Stanley Cup final appearance. And that was back in 2017 against the Pittsburgh Penguins, where they fell in six games. Um, during his tenure, though, however, only the Boston Bruins and the Pittsburgh Penguins won more regular season games than the Sharks during Doug Wilson's run. Yeah, kind of an interesting stat that you really don't think about until you know they put it on paper, obviously. You don't really think of the San Jose Sharks as being that primo team, but they really, especially in the mid to late 2010s, really had a great run with that crew uh, before they kind of disbanded uh, a little bit and are kind of going through whatever it is that they're going through right now. Milestone news. Let's stay down uh, kind of close to San Jose, but uh, more towards someone who grew up in the desert. Austin Matthews now holding the Toronto record for most goals in a single season when he hit the mark of 55 goals and then added his 56th, which moved him into the most goals by a U.S. born player in a single season in National Hockey League history. Now so. with 58. Yeah, that was 58. Yep. At the time of recording. So yeah, a lot of people think he might be able to crack 70. I don't know if he will. Uh, that's, I don't know. that's a big jump, but uh, 65, I could see 65 for sure. But yeah, so 70. Well, speaking of someone who is uh, into the 80s and approaching the 90s here oh, in, in Minnesota, superstar Kirill Kaprizov uh, scoring his record-setting 84th point uh, a fair amount ago. We actually predicted it. You did right nail on the head in our last show. Congratulations on that one. Vindication for the Alex Goligoski contract, uh, which weird. is, which is of course, the most in franchise history in a single season, his 84th point. He's now got 89 points and is one goal shy of tying Marion Gabrick's single season record of 43 goals at this time of recording on Monday 42 night. 42 is the single season record, is it not? No, it's... He was at 39 when I, re when I read the article and said he was four behind, so math. I'm pretty sure it's still 42. I don't think Gabrick got 43. And in fact, I, I'm going to look at that right now while you look. All right. I guess we'll see. I That's what the article said. He was at 39. They said he needed four to catch him. So um, I'm telling you, because I'm old, it's 42. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to look. Well, he has 42 right now. So I imagine we would have heard something that he would have tied it if, they, if he would have. He did tie it. I don't know. <laughs> he did tie it. He tied it yesterday. Yeah, okay. Well, whatever. I. Uh, Kirill Kaprizov's good at hockey. So I'm trying to say, uh, you know, who's not good at hockey Chicago, but they had a guy who was good at hockey three times Stanley cup champion, Marion Hosa signed a one day contract and will become the eighth player in team history to have his number 81 retired with over 500 goals and 1000 points over a 19 year career last played in 2016, 17 after a skin condition ended his career. So I uh, actually played in five Stanley cup finals, all things considered winning three of them. So a very interesting career for him. Uh, long careers as well. Retirement news. Anaheim's Ryan Getzloff finally calling it a career at the end of this season, his 17th season in the National Hockey League. Anaheim's franchise leader in games played with 1,150, assists with 731, and points with over 1,000. Two Olympic gold medals, a Stanley Cup, World Junior gold, U18 gold, and a World Cup gold medal as well. So pretty impressive career from Ryan Getzloff. Uh, been pretty much a mainstay uh, in the Ducks organization since they essentially rebranded, so to speak, back uh, in the mid-2000s. Buffalo Sabres setting a record, not a good one, 
missing the playoffs for the 11th straight time, eclipsing the Edmonton Oilers and the Florida Panthers, who are both at 10 straight seasons in terms of missing the playoffs. Um, they did retire longtime play-by-play voice Rick Jinnerette to the rafters. Uh, I don't know if you got a chance to see this ceremony, but if you didn't, go take 20 minutes on YouTube and watch it. It was a beautiful, beautiful ceremony, and I think you and I both uh, working in broadcasting, Nick, really appreciated this a lot more. Uh, Jinnerette calling games in all but the inaugural season for the Sabres, a span of 51 years calling games for Buffalo. April 29th against Chicago will be his last NHL call of his career. So be there or be square. Uh, speaking of things in the press box, Philadelphia defenseman Keith Yano's Iron Man streak that was snapped at 980 side, excuse me, 989 consecutive games with a healthy scratch on April 2nd. It was the first time he was scratched in a regular season game since March 2009. He also has a league worst minus 39 rating. So I might have some indication as to why he was ending up in the press box. Finally, injury news, New Jersey standout, Jack Hughes out for the year with an MCL sprain. Also New Jersey is shutting down miles wood and Jonas Siegenthaler for the year in Calgary. Sean Monahan is out for the year and will require hip surgery. Vancouver's Brock Bester is out indefinitely with an upper body ailment. Matt Dumbo was also reevaluated uh, and not as serious as Minnesota originally thought, but we'll have to see where he is trending on this one. And Drew Doughty, recent news from the LA Kings, is now shut down for the year and will need wrist surgery. And uh, yes, 42 is the number. 42. 2007, 2008, 42 goals, 41 assists, 83 points for Marion Gabrick. So Kirill Kaprizov tied right now. 42 wow. goals, 47 assists, 89 points. Uh, so one more goal to break the all-time goals a, in a season record for Minnesota Wild. All right, so let me write that down. So Nick Maxson remembering things. That's Nick Maxson 1 and Nick Maxson not remembering things, 1,428. Congratulations, Nick. I'll take what I can get. New milestone on the we show. All know, we all know I suck, but I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll take I'll take this one. We, well, we'll, we'll give it to you as well. And, uh, you know, you did call the Kirill Kaprizov uh, in his game when he was able to break the franchise record for most points in a single season. You called that so one. Did, or that so did you. Yeah, but I'll give you a second point just for fun. I'll write it no, down. No, no, we'll, I don't we'll need frame it. it. I don't need it. Ah, all right. Well, what we do need, of course, is some college hockey and NHL news, and there's nobody else that's better able to help us than Sid Wolf, who joins us in the main portion of the show. And welcome in to episode number 107 here on the Huskies Warming House podcast. Myself, Noah Grant, alongside Nick Maxson, and also the Wolf of St. Cloud State Street, Sydney Wolf. Sydney, it is a pleasure to have you here. As always, it is your, is it second time on the show? Third. I think Third. it's, I, I did one quick recap after mm. a game, so I guess two and a half. Yeah, we'll count it. We'll make it we'll, a half. We'll pull the Ben Holden rule, make it an honorary three. But anyway, okay. speaking of the rules of threes and all things Excel spreadsheet wise, how has the past couple of weeks been treating you? Uh, how is uh, the new job treating you? I guess it's not so new anymore. But for those who don't know what you do, who the heck are you and what have you been up to? Yeah, for sure. I know it's been a long time. I think last time I was on the podcast was like this summer. So a lot of things have changed. Uh, working for the Rink Live now, I mostly cover youth hockey, but I kind of delve into a little bit of everything, to be honest. But it's been great. Uh, really fun. I've been able to watch a ton of hockey, so much hockey, but I love it. So it's really fun. It's really cool. Um, yeah, it's been great. Uh, I've been Updated my portal spreadsheet, which uh, I'm sure if you're watching this, you've probably seen it. Uh, if not, go to my Twitter and check it out. It's usually my pinned tweet, but I just decided to make a spreadsheet of all of the people in the transfer portal. No, I don't have access to it, uh, but I have ways of gaining information and I've organized it and have kept it up. And I think people have really liked it. Uh, my measly 300 Twitter follows followers <laughs> is now almost up to 700 because of this. So it's been like really crazy because I don't ever think of myself as like a cool Twitter person, but I definitely feel like it now after all this like transfer portal craziness, but yeah, watching a ton <laughs> of hockey. I watch pretty much every level now. College is over now, sadly, but mm. you know, the transfer portal keeps me busy. Youth hockey, triple A starting up juniors still has a bunch of games left. So watching a lot of hockey and the wild too, obviously doing pretty good, but but yeah. It's been busy, but it's been good. I'm watching hockey and I get paid to watch hockey. So <laughs> not much is better than that. 
That's I think Nick and I, we pay to watch hockey at this particular juncture. <laughs> yeah. Like you had kind of alluded to, the NAHL season is in its last week of the regular season, so you and I are intently focused on that. As always, it's also scary that Sid Wolf now has more followers than the Hussies Warming House podcast on Twitter, so we need to get our rears in gear, Mr. Nick Maxson. Nick, you watch hockey, from what I've been told. Uh, how has <laughs> – no, not a big hockey guy. Uh, how has your week been? Busy. <laughs> you? Nah. That's it. <laughs> that's all Busy. you got. Good answer. Busy. Yeah, that's he's a, it. He's a man of few words. What can I say? Uh, speaking of words and things to be looking forward to on the Huskies Warming House podcast, if you're listening to this, well, that means the show is out and it's live uh, coming out on Tuesday morning, unless something crazy happens, like, I don't know, a giant snowstorm or something. But other than that, uh, we do have uh, some scheduling Right now, we are anticipating a Sunday release of some sort for episode number 108 here on the Huskies Warming House podcast. That might change. Not particularly sure, but that is Easter weekend, so bear with us uh, as we go through that process. And then the week after, which is the last week uh, of April, uh, we are, um, well, last two weeks of April, I should say, we are going to take a week off, Nick and I are, here on the Huskies Warming House podcast, and then return May 1st, right for the start of the NHL playoffs. So if you're wondering when you're going to find all of our content, that's what you have to look forward to. But um, I do want to start uh, here with a little bit of news that actually comes out of professional women's hockey. And Nick, I want to get your opinion on this first. Uh, I, the, the PWHPA, or essentially the Pro Women's Hockey Players Association, uh, they met uh, and they've been meeting with the Premier Hockey Federation, which of course is the only professional women's league in North America, um, essentially about trying to work out a partnership. And today they've announced that uh, they want nothing to really do with the Premier Hockey Federation, stemming kind of over a lack of funding and a real concrete plan for how to really move the women's game forward. Uh, this news is kind of hot off the press, so we don't have a whole lot of information. But Nick, kind of seems like this carousel for women's hockey just keeps going around and around. Yeah, and you know, it, it, it's 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 a very tough situation too because you have the league itself, which has made some strides in terms of viewership, in terms of interest. Um, but the long-term security of women's hockey is still very much up in the air. Um, and I think some of the more recent events, such as how the way that the world, uh, you know, the world juniors was treated the way that the world, you know, so the U 18s, the U eight, the U 16. So obviously for those who, who missed that, the men's side, they, they at least tried to play the preliminary rounds and then it was canceled midway. Um, and then the women's essentially never got off the ground, but more importantly, they never really had an interest in terms of rescheduling it. So uh, I think it, there's a lot than just the partnership with the pro hockey players and the players association. I think they really are trying to batten down, you know, what is the future of women's hockey and what does that look like? And more so, you know, can we, is there a sustainable future that's in front of us? And so there's a lot of moving parts, as you mentioned, there's a lot of things to consider. And before you pour resources and time and money into a partnership, I think they really want to know exactly where things are headed and more so are they going to have the time and the security of a future ahead of them? So it's, again, it's, it's, it's a lucrative, a dynamic situation uh, that's in front of them. And, you know, obviously a lot of things have to be addressed and it, it's just, it's unfortunate that, you know, there isn't enough right now where they can come together and try to work it out together. I think that's, that's the worst part about the whole thing. Certainly Sid. one of the benefits uh, of course uh, with your current occupation is that you get to be around a lot of these uh, facilities in that kind of intimate level at the youth level and getting to see young hockey players, both male and female, try to grow their respective games and try to get involved with uh, the generation that comes before them. Uh, as far as this news related to women's hockey, I mean, do you feel like this has significant implications when it comes to, you know, the growth of the game? Yeah, I think it's just going to be interesting to see how it plays out because two leagues would definitely be sort of s strange to just see how it works. And obviously, uh, you know, I want as many opportunities as possible for women's hockey, but, you know, you don't want to have two that are, you know, trying to compete with each other or one that's way better than another if a another one, you know, isn't paying very well or things like that, you know, you just want the best for the players and making sure they're taken care of and all that stuff. So obviously I just want, you know, the best opportunities for those players. And to, I just want to see how that ends up. I don't know how they'll get to it 
conclusion, but I just hope it's, you know, the best for the players and giving them the most opportunities they can um, because, you know, I want to see women's hockey expand, but we'll kind of just have to see how it all works out because I really don't know uh, how the situation is going to end up playing out. It just seems really complicated to be honest well we know how it plays out actually know of what the nhl experienced the same thing between the nhl and the wha so Mm -hmm. eventually if if you want to move things forward there's going to have to be a consensus on one league you know if that's just the reality of the situation that the money and the partnership would be better per se but you also have to have whoever takes over um, to have the drive, the foresight, and the connections, the resources to make sure that, again, that you're not just looking at the immediate impact, but also what the future holds. I think that's the bigger questions yeah. that are in front of it. Yeah, certainly. And it's one of those things that the NHL has, I think, tried to seek a, at least a fair number of opportunities to get involved. But again, it goes back to having that viable plan where the NHL, especially with the recent COVID years, is kind of in a difficult position of its own. Least of all, besides the kerfuffle that's going on in Arizona to boot to really change a lot of things that is going on with the league. So this is an added piece that I think the league really is trying to uh, keep its eye on. And, you know, the timing just might not be the greatest right now for a lot of things uh, related to the National Hockey League and potentially um, women's hockey right now. Men's hockey, like Sydney had mentioned, college hockey just wrapping up. Uh, Denver, your national champions, uh, out, out coming out of the Frozen Four, a very strong third period comeback, uh, ending uh, in very good fashion for the Pioneers. Trivia time. Uh, only two weeks left for two line fan trivia. Last week's question read uh, Denver winning it all uh, in their first ever tournament appearance back in 1957. Uh, they beat North Dakota by a score of six to two. However, at the Division I level, what year or season uh, was Minnesota State Mankato's first ever NCAA tournament appearance at the Division I level? Anybody know when their first NCAA tournament appearance was? What year at the Division I level? I couldn't tell you because that was wasn't it, was a wasn't, it, wasn't it last year for Mankato? No, first tournament appearance, not oh, Frozen tournament. Four. Tournament appearance. They were 0-6 before last year. 96. A little bit, little bit earlier than that, or later, I should say. Yeah, I was say uh, probably later, but I have no idea. Yeah, a little bit later. So like I said, uh, Denver winning for their first time in 1957. Their most recent championship before uh, last weekend was 2017. Minnesota State never won a national championship, but their first tournament appearance came back in 2002-2003. Uh, they are five and eight now in division one tournament history. Uh, fun fact, that game that they lost for their first ever appearance was against Cornell. So uh, kind of an interesting, uh, throwback in history, if you will, but the frozen four was very entertaining. Uh, we got a lot of close hockey games, uh, for the most part, a little bit, uh, of a wide open spread at the end of a couple of those games there, but, uh, Sydney, let's start with you, and let's start at the top of the bracket, the first game that was on the docket, the Denver Pioneers, Michigan Wolverines. Was it everything you expected, or did something surprise you? Yeah, I mean, I talked a little bit about my predictions on the Rink Live podcast last week, and honestly, I I wasn't super close on some of them, uh, just because I thought Denver-Michigan was going to be a lot more goals scored. Um, That actually ended up being more of a lower goal scored game. Uh, The first period even was really pretty mellow for goals. I thought it was going to just be back and forth, back and forth, you know, one of those like six, five games almost, but way more, uh, you know, just locked down than that, which I was pretty surprised by. I did think Denver was going to win that one um, just because, you know, Denver, I think had a good showing in the games before that. Uh, I was a little worried about Denver though, just because in the frozen face-off for the NCHC, I wasn't impressed when they played Duluth really at all. So I was kind of like, you know, I don't really know. Are they going to pick it up? Um, do they know what they're doing now in the postseason? Uh, but good win for them. And then, yeah, the other the other games too. I don't know if you want to wait for those to talk about those, but sure. Yeah, why don't why don't we do? Uh, we'll do the first two the semifinal games, and then we'll yeah. go back to the championship game. So yeah, and then Mankato Minnesota. You know, I I said Mankato just because you know I didn't think they were going to go to the Frozen Four and lose that first game again like they did against us. I thought they would for sure get to that championship. Uh, I did think the Gophers were playing pretty good before mm-hmm. that, but just Mankato just you know did a really great job. I thought they played a great game against the Gophers. Uh, And, you know, too, the Gophers in Michigan, right after they lost, they had a couple of players too, Michigan that signed (laughs) right away. So I'm sure that didn't influence them a ton because, you know, it would have been like two days later if they would have won and played in the championship game. But 
I don't know, kind of interesting. But yeah, I, I had Mankato winning that one in Denver, Michigan. I, I thought it was going to be close. I didn't really know. But yeah, was glad to see uh, Denver come out of that with the NCHC win. Nick, uh, semifinal games, uh, anything that really stuck out for you that surprised you a little bit or was it kind of par for the course? I think the only thing that surprised me was actually, I think Michigan played its most complete game all season in the semifinal against Denver, honestly. Um, you know, uh, Denver really, even in the Allentown regional, really kind of toyed with their opponents a little bit uh, because they were able to get out to early leads. Uh, then they you know, the skill and the, the, the swagger came out, right? And I think, you know, between Quinnipiac and even the IC at times, I think they realized, uh, okay, we're not going to be able to take games off. And against Denver, I really thought in that matchup that Denver had the absolute 100% advantage because of the structure that Denver plays and they have the depth, right? Michigan has got great talent, but their bottom six up front are nowhere near as good and as structured as Denver was. Um, so I wasn't necessarily as surprised as you are, Sid, to see that the game was low scoring. Um, I thought that both teams really battled, especially in front of each crease. A very, very physical battle. It was a great hockey game, uh, but it ended up being, you know, Denver uh, that uh, off of a, a really bad Michigan breakdown uh, in overtime to, to pop that one. And then for Minnesota State, again, it was the same philosophy. The Gophers were the hottest team going into that game. Minnesota State, the best team in that tournament. And again, if you're able to shut down Maddie Nyes and that line, you were going to be fine. And again, you could see the frustration uh, on the Minnesota Gophers top lines and scoring. They were able to neutralize it. Uh, Minnesota State, I think, surprised a little bit of some folks who maybe don't watch them that they have some offense too, even though they don't have the top tier talent as your Michigans or your Denvers or some other teams in the tournament. Uh, but they showed that they play by committee and why they have, were so accessible because they used every single person on the roster um, to play the same game plan and execute it at a high level. So a uh, great couple of games. I thought the right two teams won those games. And uh, again, physical battles and, and, and great overall for hockey. Of course, Minnesota State, as I'm wearing one of the jerseys right now, Andre Pavel, former Minot Minotaro, with a big hand in that Thursday victory <clears throat> over the Minnesota Golden Gophers. And, you know, I was a little bit surprised you know, when we talked about how good Minnesota had been playing, that they really weren't able to kind of get a handle and get a grip on controlling parts of that hockey game. Besides the first goal, they opened the scoring. Really, after that, it was all Minnesota State. And, you know, credit that group. And I honestly think uh, we'll move into the championship in just a second. But I thought Minnesota State, truly and honestly, for most of the weekend, played really good hockey. Uh, you know, even heading into the championship game as well, just an unfortunate result at the end. On the other side, you know, classic hockey game between Denver and Michigan, one of those games that just kind of comes down to a bounce. Unfortunately, like you mentioned, defensive breakdown. And, you know, Denver, <clears throat> as Sydney had kind of alluded to, not only in the NCHC playoffs, but even in the regional, they were really flat against UMass Lowell. They were not a team that really – sparked a ton of offensive interest against Minnesota Duluth. But, you know, at that, at that particular point, it's, um, you know, you know, they just kind of found a way to find that scoring touch and that offensive touch. I don't know that if those close games prepared them and playing a team like Duluth, maybe put them in that right frame of mind, maybe a week off helped them. But I, uh, you know, I, I was a little bit surprised to see Denver, hang pound for pound with Michigan because I could have easily seen them come out a little bit flat in that game. Nick, you had your hand, you had oh. your hand up. So Yo, I I've got those. Okay. <laughs> you... so, this, this, this may be a hot take, but I, I really truly think, and I know that the team would never admit this, but Denver was looking forward to that tournament, even in the NCHC. They didn't give a rat's rear end about the NCHC tournament. Um, David Carl even almost said it in the press conference, he was like, you know, I told the kids that, you know, let's, let's, you know, make sure that, you know, we do some of the right things, but more so I, I want our guys to be, to be healthy. I want them to do this. So he, the way that they approached and the way that they played that game against Duluth, you could just tell this was not the same Denver team and execution and style that they played. They were never on their toes. They were very laid back. It was almost like, hey, dare we say gamesmanship? Dare we say rolling the dice in terms of where they would be in the in the NCAA tournament? I think there was some strategy there. I really do feel that way. And, and again, that might upset some, some Denver people. Be, the problem is it worked. And hundred percent worked. Um, and, and again, this it was twofold. So I wasn't necessarily worried about it per se, because when they they played their first game in the NCAA tournament, yeah, they were still a little bit slow to get to the feet, but then they finally found their game. And I kind of feel like okay, if they ever found it, they would never look back. And sure enough, that's exactly what they did. 
Yeah, certainly. A, a very interesting, the matchup that we had for the championship game as well. You had Denver and kind of their uh, up and down ride, if you want to call it that, I guess, essentially getting to the national championship game, coming off of a big victory against Michigan, and then Minnesota State doing what they have done all season. And really, I mean, shots 28 to 20 in favor of Minnesota State. They had a huge margin entering period number three. It looked like they had good control of that game, despite it being a one nothing outlet one for one on the power play but for whatever reason denver the hockey god smiling on them in period number three um you know i i really do think that even with the result score ends up being five to one i thought minnesota state was the better hockey team in that game i think a couple of opportunistic bounces for denver really changed the momentum of that game you start to you know generate some momentum of your own in that hockey game and suddenly bada boom bada bang you're up three to one and you're in the driver's seat so to speak Sydney your impressions of the championship game and uh, were you surprised that Minnesota State wasn't able to hang on yeah you know it was definitely interesting I watched the whole thing uh and it wasn't very surprising that first two periods I definitely think the Mavs outplayed Denver those first two periods they just got better chances and I felt like they did a really great job of limiting Denver's really good uh, shots and their opportunities Uh, but you know a 1-0 lead isn't great heading into the third period because that's just so that's so close so watching the third period you know right when Denver tied it up I was like okay here, here you go, because Denver, you know, just wanted an overtime uh, if you, the last game before that. So, you know, they're ready to go. They're super excited. And, you know, you only got so many uh, minutes left in the third period. So if you tie, you're the team that ties it up. You, you have all the hype, you have all the energy now, uh, all that momentum switches to you. And if you're the team that got scored on, you go, oh, crap, we only got a few minutes left. We had the whole game. We could have scored another one to get 2-0. Uh, so sort of when Denver tied it up, I was like, OK, I think that might be it. And they scored that second one. I was like, I think that's game. I think that's it. Uh, I was kind of surprised, you know, the Mavs let up their 1-0 lead because I thought they've been really good at locking it down defensively. Uh, the past few games, they get a lead, they shut it down, and they just win the game. So I think when Denver got that one goal, they were just like, we don't know what to do. And then they got that second one really quick after. And I think that was honestly just game over. And Denver just kept going and kept going and kept going, honestly. So really weird game, changed really fast in that third period. That was a crazy ending to the game. Uh, but yeah, I mean, what can you do? Uh, they tied it up and they just got a ton of great, you know, goals and chances after that. Yeah. Nick, kind of a similar notion. Do I'm you feel like chops? Yes. Do you, do you feel like Denver was waiting in the wings and finally just found that goal to break no. through or no. were they in better control than you anticipated? So I said this on the on the last podcast. I think Denver did a good job of bending, but don't break. And what I mean by that is they had a game plan. Yes, Minnesota was in the upper hand, but Denver didn't stray away from what they felt like if they chipped away, chipped away, that would eventually it would get a bounce, right? You talk about hockey is a game of bounces. The goal that tied it was a rare defensive breakdown by the Mavericks, right? And to Sid's point, you know, you could qu- you could almost quantify what happened was, you know, the seesaw effect. You have Minnesota up here with Denver, then all of a sudden, boom, right? And the go-ahead goal, I think it did catch, if I, I've watched that goal a couple of times, I think it did catch a, a defenseman's stick. I think it did change directions ever so slightly to get over the shoulder um, of Dryden McKay. But even then, like in quick succession, you're what, 14 minutes left in the third period. Minnesota State, all of a sudden broke after that they were not in their structure you could tell the panic button was pressed and how i know that was how about the third goal defenseman coming off the bench and he tries to go for the big open ice hit right and you wouldn't know i know that i that if you're gonna lay a hit in the neutral zone you gotta do one of two things either get the puck or you gotta get the man you mm-hmm. can't get nothing and guess what he got nothing odd man break and denver again a very talented team themselves made him pay for it. That to me was sort of the, you know, sort of the, the way that the seesaw you could tell had completely flipped the other way at that point in my head, although I was like, okay, it's still college hockey. It's still a lot of time left. You could just tell by the way that Minnesota state was conducting themselves. That game was over. You, You know, what's really eerie. You talk about that goal and the collision between two defensemen or a defenseman and a forward, essentially. Yeah. What goal does that remind you of? in a national championship game it reminds me of the second goal that UMass scored last year against St. Cloud where St. Cloud has the shot off the crossbar 
they're down one nothing off of a fluky little bounce. They're they're playing well. All right, we're still in it. And all of a sudden, you kind of get that not really a backbreaker, but a real momentum shifter of a goal. Kind of eerily similar in the way that both those plays kind of ended up, to be honest with you. And it was the three nothing one against Nick Perbix, right? Who took an angle, an aggressive angle, try to make a body play. And then I forget who scored the goal, but and I mean, just a, a very nice dangle. I think that one made it three nothing. And again, it was that. You know, from the viewer's point, that was the backbreaker where you could tell that, okay, now we're taking some chances. We're trying to make, you know, the home run play. And at that point, you know that you've you've kind of broken your backs in terms of your structure and what you have to do. And it sucks because, as we all mentioned, I think every hockey fan would acknowledge this. Mankato was the better team for 45 minutes at this at that hockey game. Yeah. Um, they were the better team, but it, it's funny how momentum and how you know such a short span of changing events can make you just as a just from the mentality standpoint make you change the way to play the game and it's funny because you think about it 2-1 it's a, still a one shot hockey game mm-hmm. right from the other perspective and for whatever reason just it you know, feels different it feels, it feels like different. a bigger mountain than it is it, yes and yeah. it's unfortunate it's unfortunate but it, it cost the maps and it cost them the chance to raise their first banner i think I'm not alone in the room that I was as a Husky fan or as a Minnesota team, I was rooting for Minnesota state, although I'm not upset that Denver was there. I think either way, both the teams that were there deserve to be in that hockey game. They're the best two teams all year. As long as it wasn't Michigan. (laughs) I I had my doubts on Michigan going, and that's why I didn't pick them to go to the national championship game. Cause even if they would have made it, I I just either would have was gophers or I don't think they would have raised the banner. I, I, just, I, I, just I, don't. I do chuckle. And Nick, you know, you know what I'm referencing here, but I do chuckle how we talked about at the beginning of the season that we anticipated Michigan to be one of the best teams in the big 10 and really give themselves a shot uh, towards a frozen four chance. They did. And, and particular people were like, well, they didn't win the big 10 championship. They didn't make it to the title game. Blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm like, you want to talk about statistics. I mean, you had 59 other teams that, you know, could have made the big dance and that's and that sort of thing. They had a one heck of a season, and that was our point. It wasn't to say they are going to finish in this position. It was more, hey, look how good this hockey team is going to be. And now they've dumped all of their prospects, unfortunately, and they're going to have to retool and well, rebuild. In a I was say they dumped it. They just said, you know, yeah, you're good for this. So <laughs> you, <laughs> they signed. <laughs> yeah, you kind of anticipated that that was coming. I think. Um, First of all, we're going to actually flip our extra ice session and what was supposed to be the rest rest of the show, because that's why Sydney Wolf is actually really here, is we're going to talk a ton of St. Cloud hockey and transfer portal news around college hockey. So I want to transition a little bit. Uh, we're going to touch on some Minnesota Wild, but before that, college hockey still a little bit. Hobie Baker Award and Richter Award. I listened to some conversations before we get to who okay. won each of these awards. There was a discussion. Um about a particular player that was up for the Hobie Baker award. Nick, I'm going to posit you a random question before I even talk about this particular player. Oh boy. Would you rather have a team full of playmakers? So let's say, let's say you have a unit of five players on the ice. Okay. Yep. Would you rather have five playmakers or five goal scorers on the ice? And five why? playmakers. Okay. And and here's why. So typically speaking and Maybe no, you know this because you were always a playmaker, never were a scorer. Uh, <laughs> actually, I really, I really don't know that. But um, you all know, the way around, but yeah, the, yeah, right. Um, <laughs> goal scorers. I mean, let's take a St. Cloud State player who recently left. Let's take an Easton Brodzinski, who was never really a playmaker and he was a scorer. Right? Can we think about other times that he set other guys up and made other things happen on the ice? No. And I mean that with all due respect to Easton Broadson because he was good at what he did when he did score goals, but he really was a one trick pony. Honestly, at the end of the day, you have proven my point 110%. Sydney, I'm sorry you're kind of just sitting here in the passenger seat right well, now. I agree. So I, let her I jump in. The playmakers. I'd take the playmakers. So I agree. Yep. And 110% because here's the thing. When goal scorers are not in possession of the puck in shooting areas, they are not creating offense. Playmakers, doesn't matter who you are, you can set anybody up backdoor for a tap, and if you're a good enough playmaker, you control, you possess, you drive offense. Kirill Kaprizov is more of a playmaker than than he is a goal scorer, people. Let's remember that. There's a prime example for you. Although, scoring He's a nice hybrid of both. Yeah, he's a pretty good goal scorer, too. (laughs) The reason I bring this up, someone was pointing out that Bobby Brink, 
is not among, I forget if it was the top 30 or top 50 goal scorers in terms of goals for in the NCAA, but led the nation in assists. And that was their argument as to why he shouldn't be on the ballot. And I looked at that and said exactly what you guys said. I would take a guy, I would take five Bobby Brinks over so, five Easton Brzezinski's, for example, any day. And that's no offense to Easton, just by the concept of the way the game is played in such a team game. Well, how about this, Noah? Let's let's talk about line matches, right? Let's talk about your teammates, right? You could be Bobby Brink, who is, as we know, a skilled hockey player, a smart hockey player. He's a great IQ player. And you put on a line with Ryan Barrow, and I forget who else was on his line for most of the season. Uh, he wasn't the finisher. Mm -hmm. He wasn't the finisher in that line. Now, if we were to take say a couple other plays in the third line and put him with Bobby Brink. Do you think his role changes a little bit? Sure. A little bit, right? In theory. So uh, hockey is a weird game like that, where sometimes your role depends on who you're playing with. Right. Um, so uh, to me, Bobby Brink has got skill in both those areas, but I do think just for how he was able to essentially fit on that line and to really execute the offense, he was more the setup guy. And that's fine because, well, He's got a national championship. Yeah. It takes 20 plus guys to win one. It's not just one player. So, so let's talk I rest about my case. Let's talk about setups. Let's talk about your roles. How about the role of the selection committees for each group? Sydney, I have a question for you as well. Yes. Devin Levi wins the Richter Award. Dryden McKay, the Hobie Baker winner, the first goaltender since Ryan Miller in 2001. Sydney, should the best player in college hockey? Who is a who is a goaltender? Not win the best goaltender in college hockey. I mean, I'm not going to answer <laughs> your question by saying I totally saw this coming. I wasn't surprised by this at all. I called this like a month ago. To be honest <laughs> with you, hashtag uh, expert analysis. Just because, like the Hobie situation, when they announced the three finalists, I definitely knew it was going to be McKay. Uh, just because you know, with all the stuff that happened last year, and he didn't get the Richter, mm -hmm. and then just all of that other drama around it, uh, it was like, okay, I'm pretty sure he's getting it. He's broken so many records in college hockey. It's like, okay, he's had what is it, four years of being really, really solid in Mankato. Uh, I do think Bobby Brink was a close second just because of how good of a year he's had. But I've seen a lot of people on Twitter say, too, you know, Bobby Brink had such a good team, too, to work with. You know, when you have that many amazing players on your team, it's kind of like – So did Ryan McKay. It's still amazing. Right. Yeah, same with McKay. <laughs> but I think just McKay not getting the Richter last year, too, just – pushed people towards the Hobie. And I think I, I wasn't surprised by that at all. I really wasn't. Uh, and because of how good Levi was this year, I knew he was going to get the Richter too, because uh, a lot of people were like, why wasn't Levi in the top three for Hobie, like the East coast people. And I was like, well, you know, he's a sophomore. He's had two seasons. I don't know if I'd put him in top three for Hobie. Yeah. Technically, uh, te technically one season, he didn't even actually play his freshman year. And I, has there ever been a ballot where there's been two netminders in the Hobie Baker conversation now? Yeah, that I, like, I, don't, I, I don't know. I was, I was slightly surprised that Jack LaFontaine didn't win the Richter, but all, all kidding aside, uh, Devin Levi did have a good season, but Nick, were you surprised that Dryden McKay maybe didn't take home both awards or maybe the award that we thought that he was going to take wasn't the one he ended up getting. Here's what's funny. And this is, it's kind of a false dichotomy if you really think about it. It's like tiny, kind of talking into both sides of your mouth because the Hobie Baker is supposed to be the best player in college hockey. And yet the Mike Richter is saying you're the best goalie. So by proxy, does that mean Dryden McKay is still the best goaltender in the league? Right. Like really? Exactly. So, like, I think, yeah. Honestly, like that's what happens when you have two uh, such good goaltenders. You give the one who is, you know, the older one who's had such a consistent career, who's going to be moving on. Uh, the Hobie and give the younger one who's had a really great career so far too. give him the Richter. If you've got two goalies that are the best players, separate selection committees, like, too, right? they should, they should have separate, both, but... separate selection committees. And, and let me pause it to you. I think the biggest brain mess out of this whole thing, right? So do we think that Dryden McKay wins the Hobie if Bobby Brink's stats for goals and assists are flipped? I don't think so. I don't think yeah. so. So it, there, there is a there is a bias on goal scoring, mm -hmm. um, in the Holby, um, and that's where I again we would talk about the player makers versus scorers. I think that debate is stupid one, um, <laughs> be, you know, really. Uh, but at the same time, 
I think that does change things. I think Bobby would have won the Hobie, and I think that you would have seen McKay win the Richter if that was the case, because there really wasn't a dominant skater like we've seen in the past, like Kale McCarr, for example, is a recent one. He yeah. was a dominant figure, right? I don't, when you have that, goaltenders always lose that battle for the Hobie, right? Um, we've seen that again. Ryan Miller was the last goaltender to win it, and that was back in 2001. So it's, it's so weird how this year's ballot award winners. Now, again, we're not taking anything away from McKay or anything away from Devin Levi. These are two very talented hockey players and deserve the awards that they got. But it does leave some confusion as to so what does that say about each goaltender? Let's just simplify. They're both just really damn good hockey players. Mm. And at the end of the day, you had to sort of pick one or the other for the awards to, to accolade them because there really wasn't a defenseman or a forward out there that you could say had better seasons than those two guys. Yeah, it was, it's a challenging argument, uh, you know, trying to select individual items. You know, if you're looking for a plan for success, though, Nick, what you should do is you should give up three Don't goals in the first 10 minutes of a hockey game and then just score six unanswered like the Minnesota Wild do. We're going to talk about them right now. Did you know, fun fact, ladies and germs, for those of you listening, watching, or otherwise, I don't know what the otherwise would be, but regardless, uh, the Wild have tied their franchise record of 263 goals in a single season with their six goals against the Los Angeles Kings. So the next goal they score would break that record unless they never score again, which that's a shame which is not out of the question. Um, it's not impossible, <laughs> technically. Minnesota sports for you. Uh, Sydney, the Minnesota Wild uh, somehow continue to keep rolling. Had a little bit of a kerfluffle before the LA game, a couple of games that they kind of stumbled a little bit. But by and large, they've looked good. What are they, 9-2-1 and one in their past 11 or something like that? It's been a, right. been a pretty good record for them. Uh, what have you liked from the Minnesota Wild? And uh, is Marc-Andre Fleury doing all right in the net? Yeah, I mean, that 6-3 game was ridiculous. I got to say a funny story, too. Uh, I think it was the two goals. I think it was end of one period, beginning of another. I'm not sure which one because we scored six. But I went to go put a pizza in the oven, and we scored a goal when I came back. And then when I went to go take the pizza out of the oven, we scored again. So I was like, do I need to make Continue to cook pizzas. Just like- <laughs> Continue so to make weird. pizzas. Yeah, it was so weird. And I think those were goals number two and three or something. So I just kept like coming back upstairs and looking at the TV and being like, uh, something is weird hey. here. But it was it was fun. I mean, it was <laughs> it was a weird game, but it was really fun. I mean, being down three zero, not ideal. Uh, but you know, no. hey, Sid- Sydney Sydney's on that Jake Gardner plan, Nick. Just pizza after oh, pizza. God. Right up the middle. It's uh, better than the Phil Kessel of hot dogs and cheeseburgers. So I guess yeah, that's fine. I don't um, know. That game you, was just, it was crazy, uh, you, but good. Yeah, I like you know what, in that. You know what's funny for all the uproar about how Bally Sports happened to have one particular broadcast out of the whatever it is. Oh, 60s. no, it was it was like all the broadcasts. It was my yeah. Favorite. Yeah, like 65 that they actually get right. Heaven forbid you miss 10 minutes of a game. It's fine, whatever. Um, but regardless of that, as soon as the broadcast came back on, the Wild scored like 20 seconds later. So maybe Bally Sports actually saved the Wild. You don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Nick, I, I mean, should, should fans have been in an uproar about the whole? I mean, you could get the game stream if you were in the app, but there was golf on TV for a little bit. I mean, do those – obviously it doesn't happen often, and Sydney, feel free to chime in too, but – Sometimes TV doesn't work as you expected. Should fans not feel like they should be entitled for 10 minutes of hockey that they're never going to get back? Can I butt in really quick? I think the complaints mostly that I was reading weren't just because they didn't have it. It's because, too, you can't get Bally Sports on any, like, streaming apps, like a lot of Mm. people that have YouTube TV and stuff. So when you pay specifically to get Bally and it doesn't work, then I think a lot of people were upset because they're like, I pay to have this. Sure. So yeah, they're, they're, I, I get those complaints. Their app is tough. They're supposed to be making a smartphone app or a smart TV app soon, which I have to airplay everything to my TV because I run off my parents' provider. But um, regardless, Nick, uh, how are the Wild doing and how is Valley Sports doing? <laughs> So, yeah, three nothing down is not ideal. In fact, it's not going to win you many playoff games, honestly, um, unless you're the Florida Panthers. And apparently no lead is insurmountable. Apparently, <laughs> um, that's just insane. Uh, but it, it does on the flip side show you a couple of things. It shows this team can regroup. It shows it can refocus and it shows that like, OK, we're down three nil. Um, OK, let's let's tighten things up. Let's go to work. Right. It's not just OK. Towels over my shoulder. Let's just. Come on, I got a massage appointment at 940 after the game. Let's just get this thing going, right? So, um, it, you know, 
Defensively, I still think there's some question marks um, if they continue to have injury problems. Um, Jordy Ben is not the most fleet of foot. We've understood that. Um, he's gotten burned a, cre- a few times. But at the end of the day, here's what I want to address. The Kalen Addison thing, right? Cool. Kalen Addison. Yeah, right. The, <laughs> apparently this amazing like the godsend, the godsend D from Iowa. First of all, the only thing that Iowa is godsend is the field of dreams. It's just let's just leave it there. Um, they got corn. They, they they have a few an Iowa pork apparently. Apparently that's a trademark. Um, but no, um, Kalen Addison is not the type of defenseman statute wise that you want in a playoff game. You already have one of those. His name is Jared Spurgeon. The reason why you brought in Middleton is yes, he's showing some offense, but he's a little bit of that sandpaper, right? He's the complement to Jared Spurgeon. Who else are you, are you really going to put Kalen Addison next to Jonas Brodeen? No, you're not. So at, at the end of the day, you you have your depth guys like Goligoski and John Merrill, Dmitry Kulikov, uh, and Jordy Ben to try to bring you you know that size because you're going to need that size in the playoffs. I'm sorry. The size matters. Jack McNeely, just to put the college spin on this, was to me the best defenseman in the entire tournament. Uh, the way that he was able to angle guys off, be physical, especially in the point of attack at the blue line. And then if you know, you're able to just let them get in the corner, you funnel them in and they need to finish them off. I mean, Kalen Addison's not your answer. Yes, finish him. Um, he's not the answer. He's he's going to be a stud in the blue end at one point. He is not the answer the Wild need right this moment. Um, the Wild are going to be fine. Um, f- the Nashville game, it's a bad game. That yeah. we, every team is going to have it. I chuck that out. You know what? It, it's just if, if you have one bad game in like 12 or 13 starts, you're doing okay. Honestly, they're fine. Yeah. So they're doing all right. You, well, you heard it here first from Nick Max and size matters. And you're talking about a little bit of sandpaper God. on top of that final topic for the regular portion of the show. Sydney, if you have anything else about to add about the Minnesota wild one, I don't care. And two, feel, feel free to oh. chime, chime so in. So why do you, you ask then? If, if you, if you have anything, I'm actually talking about sandpaper and a lot of BS sandpaper, so to speak. We actually didn't get a chance to talk about this uh, in depth, I don't think, Nick. We talked about it a, a tad, um, but I really want to get uh, Sid's thoughts on this. Uh, did Troy Terry deserve to be absolutely fed about 27 haymakers in that game against Jay Beagle the other night? What's the story there? Oh, God. I mean, no. I think I'm on the side <laughs> of the people. Uh, yeah, I don't – yeah, I I don't know. I am Not- definitely on those side of the people that like the – the new game, the sort of lacrosse goals. I know some people hate those, but I like the skilled. John Tortorella. I was just about to say like that. I like it. I don't care. I think the people that are mad about it need to like, just chill. Cause people love it. It brings more people into hockey. Chill out. Calm All right. Down. Well, we're going to turn so. Sydney's mic off because she's clearly been <laughs> skilling it up and hot dogging a little bit too much here. Uh, she's going to be ready to get punched in the mouth according to Tyson Nash. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. God. Yeah. yeah I, don't, I don't get that take at all. Apparently Tyson, I don't. Yeah, Tyson Nash's it's comments is, of course, made. Uh, that's a hot dang. take as the Arizona desert. My God. <laughs> yeah, things things are going uh, well down in K- the Kachina um, sweater land there. Uh, but nonetheless, Nick, uh, the Troy Terry incident, uh, your thoughts, man? Dumb. <laughs> uh, to say yeah. it lightly. Come on, Jay Beagle is ama- one goal in the season. So it, He's lighting so, up. So here's what's funny. So let's actually break this down a little bit step by step, and I'll try to be as concise as I can. Notice how Trevor Zegers actually didn't have a like really a problem when he was cross-tracked because he's like, well, I'm digging for the puck. Well, is it loose? Well, yeah. Well, do you think everybody knows it's freaking loose? No. So he knows if you're going to be in the goalie's kitchen that you're going to get attention. That's just how the hockey works. Yeah. Everybody's problem with the Troy Terry thing was when Beagle was in a scruffle, there was – a non-willing combatant one. And then when you're down on the ice, there's, I don't know if you want to call it hockey code. I really don't want to go that far because it opens up a whole different can of worms that we don't have time to address. Uh, but when someone goes down, that's like your red light to say, okay, it's, it's over with it. He gets continued to wail on him. Right. Oh, oh, if you want to open up a can of worms, did you actually know that if you hit somebody, I think it's more than one time uh, and maybe even one time, if the situation calls for it, whether down on the ice, technically, Technically, it's actually, uh, I believe it's battery, if I'm not mistaken, uh, according to a lot. Like, you can't, you cannot actually, like, by legal definition, you cannot continue to hit someone oh. when they're defenseless on the ice. Like, it's actually not like, brought illegal. to you by the law of us of Noah Grant. And I'm never recruiting your services. Anyways, yeah. America's but, wasteland. Yeah, right. So <laughs> you're not, you're not technically wrong, technically. Uh, yeah. But at the end of it, yeah, no, there's, there is just, you know, 
when the when the guy goes down, you stop. He didn't. And to t- and I think what really drove people nuts is when Tyson Nass is going, "Hey, it's a five nothing game, and if you're gonna skill it up, meaning you're showboating." And I, I get him with you said it's it's not. The the Zeke is there, you know, rise of skill. And you can even go back to the Austin Matthews and the Zoros, and we, you know, all these different stick handling things that even Connor McDavid is was not quite as, say, flashy in the moment, although he's just insane. Um, you're seeing the skill age start to take over here, right? That doesn't mean that when you're up five nothing and the most highly contested, highly competitive league in the entire world in hockey, that you take your foot off the gas. Last I checked that uh, any lead in hockey or any professional sporting event is never safe until the clock runs zeros. Yeah, just ask the, just ask right. the Maple so, Leafs. Right. It just asks you yeah, the Maple Laughs. Yes. Did you know uh, they actually – They actually someone put a statistic. Their last collapse against Florida, I think, was their seventh since uh, 2013 in the first round. The next closest team to have that many collapses by that big of a margin uh, is four times for a particular team. So Yeah. So at the end of it, no, you're in a professional league. If you don't like that Troy – you know, Troy Terry or Trevor Zegers is, you know, haven't, well, if you take away time and space, the last I checked, you probably can't pull off those kinds of moves, right? Did you know Arizona actually could have avoided this whole thing, Nick? Do you know how? Punch him in the mouth? No. How about don't give up five goals? Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. You know, just <laughs> who would have thunk? And again, it's like, I, I just find that silly to me. It's like, okay, yeah, you're embarrassed. You feel like you're embarrassed. Yeah. You're getting beat up five, nothing again, but that doesn't mean you have the right or the authority to go and start punching skilled players, right? Um, it's bad for the game. It's bad for the growth of the game, especially just some of the more skilled players. Short Terry, um, another national championship winner with Denver. Holy heck. Um, he's, he's had a good career, right? Yeah. Uh, um, you know, you need those guys in the lineup. It's, it's, it's almost like you kind of wonder if the NHL – department place every no they're not going to do a damn thing i'm sorry um <laughs> but you know you kind of wonder if the nfl where they took the onus you know to really protect quarterbacks so they uh, at some point if more of these skill players enter the league um are they going to start to look at and protect these kinds of players a little bit more unless somebody different the, at the department of player safety enters in probably not but that to me is the biggest change. The Department of Player Safety needs to start holding these players accountable for these actions and like actually set a precedent, not be afraid to give out suspensions for these kinds of acts. Until that happens, more of these events are going to take place. Talking about accountability, we're going to talk about a particular protection list that is out and about. Sydney Wolf is going to give our takes on all things, all things St. Cloud State Hockey. They made some latest moves. A couple of guys have signed and had some success at the next level. And we're going to take a look at what St. Cloud State Hockey might look like as we head through the summer. And welcome into the Extra Ice Session here on the Huskies Warming House Podcast. Noah Grant, myself, along with Nick Maxson, and our special guest, Sydney Wolf, who has done a fantastic job for the Rink Live and in the Twitter sphere, getting us prepped for all things transfer portal related. St. Cloud State having a lot of moves. I shouldn't say a lot, but a fair number of moves in terms of transfer portal things relative to uh, what we've seen from them in the past week or so. The biggest one uh, that we have seen as of late, this one just dropping not too long ago, uh, goaltender Dominic Bassey is heading from Colorado College to St. Cloud State. He's a sixth round pick of the Chicago Blackhawks back in 2019. Two seasons at Colorado College, who, mind you, let's not forget the Tigers uh, have had the not- greatest of runs in those years so take these numbers with a little bit of a grain of salt but standing at six foot six he was 10 26 and three with a 321 goals against average which is not terrible uh for a team like cc in the nc and an 891 save percentage across 41 games not too shabby i think also a colorado connection here for st cloud uh video uh video coordinator and director of hockey apps rj anga actually used to be uh an assistant coach at cc before heading to st cloud state so there's a little connection there as well a couple of other updates uh two-year captain spencer meyer he returns for a fifth season rejoining uh 53 points and 139 games played for him. And Nolan Walker signing with the Toronto Marlies in the AHL. He actually joins Western Michigan's defenseman Michael Joyu on that team as well. So wishing Nolan the best of luck. Very quickly before I get you guys' opinion here, recapping what we've already known, Seamus Donahue, Kevin Fitzgerald, heading to the ECHL to the South Carolina Stingrays, actually both scoring a goal already and making some pretty good contributions. It's been pretty impressive from both of them. Nick Perbix, his entry-level deal. He's in Syracuse in the Tampa Bay organization. David Rennick signing his deal with the Los Angeles Kings, and Issa Brodzinski did officially sign a contract with the Hartford Wolfpack in the AHL. So um, St. Cloud currently... 
as far as formal, formal announcements go, seven forwards, five defensemen, two goaltenders on the roster. From what Sydney Wolf uh, has alluded to me, Micah Miller, Aiden Spellacy, and Brendan Bushy all plan to return uh, and potentially announce their return in whatever fashion that is going to be. Also, thanks to Mick Hatton at the Rink Live as well for that. So that would leave nine forwards, six defensemen, and two goaltenders as a result. So, Sydney, we'll start with you. Uh, Dominic Bassey, did you have a feeling this one was coming? Is this exactly what St. Cloud needed, or did this one uh, strike you as a little bit of a surprise that they actually were able to get their man? Yeah, I mean, I sort of saw this coming between him entering the portal. Uh, You know, you're in the NCHC. I feel like a lot of the good NCHC players will probably stay in the conference. And then just what I've been hearing, too, through the grapevine, uh, I was definitely ready for Bassey to commit. I know he probably had a couple other schools, you know, looking at him, too, uh, because a lot of schools need goalies right now. But uh, I wasn't too surprised to see him commit here. Uh, I know some people are kind of worried about his stats. But like we said, you know, Colorado College has not played the best the past two years so I really wouldn't be too worried about that um it's definitely going to be interesting to see how he will play for us in goal just because he's not really that similar to David Rennick he's way taller than him he's a really big goalie uh so we're gonna get you know try out that new sort of big goalie trend because he's six foot six so he's a he's a big guy but I'm pretty excited to see how it works out just because our decor is going to be a lot better than CC. So hopefully we can help them out a little bit too, but I'm pretty excited about it. I still am not really sure what we're going to do with that third goalie option. If we're going to bring in our recruit, if we're going to pick some up from juniors, or if we just grab another goalie from the portal, I assume it wouldn't be another like main person, but that's still kind of a question mark, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see Bassie uh, in a, in a Husky sweater. Certainly fills a void. And the other goaltender for recruiting is Isaac Posh, who we touched on in our last show in Sioux Falls. You wonder is Sioux Falls the better development route or does, you know, him practicing and maybe getting a couple of games for St. Cloud. Uh, is that the better option for him moving yeah, forward? I mean, you know, I've heard through the grapevine they might want to send him back for another season, but I could also see him just coming in and getting established for one year or two, even if he doesn't play. So I I really don't know. We'll have to see. Certainly, as Joey Lamroux, of course, the other netminder entering the transfer portal for St. Cloud. Nick, uh, do you think Isaac Posh makes the jump? And uh, the goaltender in front of him, Dominic Bassey, it, does he fill a really big void for St. Cloud right now? He does. Um, you know, in, in again, when you, when you talk about the last trio that St. Cloud State had, and that it was David Rennig, uh, Lamroux, as well as Caster, you want competition at that position, right? You you don't want a guy that's the your unanimous number one. You want guys pushing each other in fact on this exact podcast we had all three of them on at once about a year and a half ago now yeah, uh Noah Grant. 2020 right and they all echo the same thing you know they push each other it's 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 friendly competition but you know if you don't have competition at any position that means uh you're not getting really better there's no really no you know advantage to 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 being in that spot so the question with isaac posh is going to be you know does he feel and does the San Jose Huskies feel is his development better suited here or is it better suited at the junior level? Now the team's lack of success is going to play probably a little bit part of that decision. Uh, because again, we both know uh, all three of us know, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm not used to having two other people in here. I'm so sorry. I said, um, <laughs> This is where the old he, the he, w- he wasn't really- referring to me. I, I was probably the one who didn't know, honestly. No. Anyways, <laughs> um, but, you know, you, you kind of wonder does, you know, because you a goaltender can get bad habits off of a bad team that's playing in front of him. Right. You know, goaltending mm-hmm. statistics have a lot to do with a team that plays in front of them. So, you know, if, if it's a porous defensive court, does he overplay pucks? Does he try to do too many things where he should be more, you know, calm and reserved in his crease and, and really just focusing on the, the shot and where, you know, things are coming from, or is he trying to cover for defensive mistakes and he's trying to overplay the puck a little bit? Um, you know, that that's a tricky situation. I'm not sure there's a, a right or wrong answer, but I do think, you know, it's something that has to be talked about with Isaac and St. Cloud in terms of what would be best for him. It might be best to get him up here and to face, you know, maybe better shooters and maybe also have better defensive presence in front of him to get him acclimated. Or they may say, hey, you know what? Um yeah, you may not have a great team in front of you, but prove me that you can play at a higher level uh, and then come back and we'll see. So it's a hard again we'll have to wait and see but if it were me bring him up yeah 
Same com up. same conversation as you mentioned with Dominic Bassey, you know, moving to what is on paper a potentially better team than Colorado College for St. Cloud. What expectations should we have from Dominic right out of the gate if he is indeed the starting netminder on day one? Uh, I mean, I'm just kind of letting my expectations just – I don't know. I don't really have any, to be honest. Are, are, are you sure you're a true Huskies fan, Sid? That doesn't yeah, sound like you know a real I mean? one. I feel like so many people have so many <laughs> high expectations. I, th I think he'll do fine. I, I'm one of those people with – hockey i encourage everyone else to do this too don't even set your expectations high because then if we exceed them then you'll be super happy but if we don't exceed them then it's fine you're not super upset about it you know manage that, manage the emotions a little bit that's what every but, listener uh, and viewer of the huskies warming house podcast has subscribed to yeah. for two years and change uh <laughs> yeah next, for sure uh next. and i guess uh i just wanted to butt in too and sure. say another goalie I was kind of watching too. I had, I don't, I don't have any inside info or anything, but I was kind of wondering too, what might happen to, to, we were talking about the St. Cloud Norseman before this, their goaltender, Thomas Bolo. I really liked him. Yeah. Uh, he's from Slovakia. So I was kind of like, Hey, if we wanted another Slovak uh, in yeah. that the Slovakian uh, he's right over at the Norseman too. So I was yeah. kind of like, we got plenty of options here. Uh, just around St. Cloud too. If we just want to pick somebody up, that's kind of just a random player. But he, he's yeah. pretty, he's pretty good. Of course, Ethan Dahlmeyer is their backup. Has played well uh, as well. Of course, they were just in Minot playing the Minotauros, and you know both those goaltenders. The challenge with them is they, especially during the second half, they haven't seen a ton of pucks, and in the first half they were a little bit porous. So you kind of wonder how they would adjust at the yeah. next level. It's kind of some teams are good at picking up those null goalies. I know Duluth has had a lot of success with that. So I'm like, you know, maybe a if we need a third yeah. guy. Zach you know, Sandy, you know? man, they picked him up. And I, I telling you, I was telling Brett Larson, well, you got to look at this kid. And of course, uh, his, his old school man, uh, Sandlin swoops in and yeah, picks up the goaltender up. with the best save percentage in the NHL. You, you know they, what happened, Noah, is that Brett probably is like this this idiot from North Dakota keeps telling me the Zach Sand, you know, Sandy kid. And then, you know, hey. Sandlin goes, Hmm, maybe I should look at this. Then he goes in and sweeps him up. That's probably what happened. Hey. So you probably had a hand in it. Hey, sounds pretty ill-advised. Um, besides that, yeah. what Nick, what should we expect from Dominic Bassey? Should we expect anything? I mean, obviously something, but. <laughs> so, you know, when any player transitions from one system to another, you know, you have to expect some bit of learning curve, right? However, it's different with goaltenders, right? Because the way that you are on your angles, the way that you aggressively play the puck, that's all the same. It's more of does Dominic Basie feel comfortable in playing his game and being a sort of like less is more essentially for goaltenders in a system that in his, you know, latest history has been like, okay, we're going to make our job on the goaltender easier than it has to be. Right. So what I expect for a goaltender at that size at six foot six, right, is, you know, to come in who has NCHC experience uh, to play well. Uh, is he going to be a dominant Hashik? I think that's what Sidney Wolf was trying to say. Let's get another Slovak. Um, you know, <laughs> you know, essentially what's what's trying to find the next, you know, double pad stack guy. Uh, but, you know, at the end of it, you, you hope that it reinvigorates his, you know, sort of his desire and his, you know, his lust for the game at the end of the day, because, I think he's a solid goaltender. I think I know the, the times that he's played St. Cloud in at the Herb, he's kind of given us fits. He, he's a capable goaltender. But you kind of wonder when you're on a team that hasn't had the great win-loss record and success that does it change the goalie's approach to the game? It absolutely does. So you kind of wonder if, you know, to this system and an obviously to our organization that he chose to come here that he can just be more of like, you know, the secondary, you know, star of the game and not feel like he has to be putting the team on his back and try to win the game by himself. I think that's the biggest thing with goaltenders. If you can feel like you're that guy that, you know, it's kind of like a defensive guard where you're on the, you know, you're doing a lot of the dirty work, but you're not getting the recognition for it as a goaltender. That's the, that's the kind of role you like. You don't want to be the star player. You want to be the guy that's in the background doing what you got to do, but maybe not necessarily stealing hockey games every now and then. You wonder what this St. Cloud roster will look like a, as well. Dominic uh, might be the perfect fit as this St. Cloud group kind of goes through a bit of transition as the new young guns start to come in and the, the guys that have already been here start to kind of fill into their new roles and maybe higher up roles than what they had previously. Before we talk about that very quickly, 
notable NCAA moves in the transfer portal related kind of to St. Cloud State land and kind of to our show a little bit. The loose Connor Kelly, he's headed to Providence. So that's kind of a, a little bit of a loss for the Bulldogs there. Uh, Jake uh, Pivanka, he's going to attend uh, Nebraska Omaha. He's leaving Notre Dame. Uh, our picks that we had uh, last week, uh, Ty Jackson, as well as Dylan Jackson and Netminder TJ Sem. Semptim Felter, excuse me, left Northeastern all for Arizona State University. That one is official. Oh, so, geez. so all those guys headed to ASU. And then uh, a name that apparently sounded like a Husky, but never ended up being one, Slava Demon. He's headed to Merrimack. I wanted to throw that one in there, of course. But uh, we take a look at this roster for those who missed it last week. As we mentioned, with Aiden Spellacy and Micah Miller allegedly joining the fold again, as well as Spencer Meyer for sure and Brendan Bushy, as we've talked about. Brady Zemer, Andre Trebel, Josh Lidke, Jack Peart on the back end to round six defensemen. Ryan Rosborough, Yami Cranola, Zach Okabe, Mason Salquist, Joey Molinar, Chase Brand, Vietti, Mietnin, and then, of course, Jackson Caster and Dominic Bassey in net. Uh, Sydney, before we get to the incoming class for St. Cloud State, do you feel like this team has made their one move in the transfer portal or are there other things that you feel like are yet to come for this group as far as maybe trying to pick up some guys that have played some years at the D1 level? Yeah, I think we've still got some moves left, to be honest. Like I sort of already said with the goaltending, I'm not sure what we're going to do with that third person just because we have so many options. We can bring in our recruit. We can get another transfer if we just want somebody who just, you know, wants to be on the team, maybe not play that much or just be, you know, another good solid backup. Uh, or we could just pick somebody else up from juniors. We'll just kind of have to wait and see. Not sure what we're going to do with goal. Uh, otherwise, I'm pretty sure we'll still try and hit the portal for a center. I know I've been talking about that today. Uh, Grant Crookshank entered the portal uh, previously of CC. He already played there for three years in the NCHC and then just played this last season on the Big Ten with the Gophers. He's in the portal. I can easily see him coming to St. Cloud State. Uh, we need center depth really badly. He's already played in the conference uh, maybe he wants to stay in Minnesota. He just played for the Gophers. So I could see him coming in. Uh, and then, too, I could I could see maybe room for one more forward. I don't think we're going to get any more D uh, just because we'll talk about that later. I think we're just going to bring in our recruits there. So I could see maybe a goalie, maybe a forward. But definitely I think we're going to get a center from the portal. Nick, we talked about this a little bit pre-show. Grant Crookshank had an okay season for Minnesota, but it probably wasn't the breakout year uh, that the Gophers were potentially hoping is he a better fit on St. Cloud State? Is this a move that the Huskies should, should look at? And uh, besides Grant Crookshank, is there anyone else that, or any particular position like Sydney had said that you feel maybe has a void that could be filled with the transfer portal? Center one is big. Uh, the one name that we talked about, and I talked about the Brett, that's actually currently a Husky, and it's got the size and the and you know and really the the angst to be one. How about Ryan Roseboro? Um, mm-hmm. He was a guy that uh, I know Brett had talked to. They were actually looking to try to get him into a game at the end of the season. I just feel like. You know, when you get to tournament time, you, you don't want to disrupt, you know, line chemistry and those kind of things. So I just think it was too little too late for Ryan uh, for him to get in. But he's what, six foot three, six foot four, uh, big kid from Ontario. Six, three. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so and I think the, the big thing that you know, kind of hurts Ryan a little bit is not the not the best of skater uh, from what I've seen in practice. Uh, good hockey IQ. But, you know, you, you kind of wonder because you know, when I, you know, I talked about this is. The departures of Will Hammer and Jared Cocker really killed this Husky squad, 100%. It was that shutdown line that really honed their role, accepted their role, and was able to take away the opposing offense's top guns. Uh, we didn't really have that this year. We just did not. And that's why you saw many blown leads, especially you know late in the season against Duluth and a couple of other opponents. We just weren't able to hold a lead. And part of that is got to have a, a third and a fourth line uh, that can, whether it's you know, hold possession in the offensive zone, um, or at least if you're in the defensive zone, that can defend well, keep things to the outside, and, and prevent you know great A scoring chances. We just never were able to really execute that the way we did last year. Um, so I would actually look at Ryan Rosbro uh, as a potential guy that you know could come in. He's got the size to be a really good third line shutdown center. Thing is, I haven't seen him play. How is he in the faceoff dot? That's always critical in those situations. Again, that was Kevin Fitzgerald this last year when it was uh, I, again. Uh, hammer last you know, the season pre- previous to that that was you know their big go to face off man um to me it's all about center depth uh again they mm-hmm. just they, they there were plenty of times they didn't start with possession and carry possession and that's going to be a huge need of improvement for the squad that comes right down the middle yeah, yeah. 
I was just going to say the guy that I had my eyes on that just went to Boston College, of course, was, was Cam Burke, who we talked about, who was from Notre Dame. Two guys that are of interest. I know we talked a little bit about Chase Primo uh, last year. I haven't mm. seen it, if he has signed. Uh, He's with gone any, to Notre Dame. He's Notre Dame. Uh, there it is. Okay, yeah, just Notre Dame and here. Omaha flip-flopped people. The one that is a bit more of a recent one, and I want to get your guys' opinion on I'm going to go backwards uh, in this direction. So I'm going to start with Nick. Uh, North Dakota's Ashton Calder, uh, 21 points in 34 games this past season. Is he a guy that maybe you could see a fit uh, on the St. Cloud roster? Maybe. Uh, again, it depends on the role, right? Uh, you know, Ashton Calder, again, has the talent if you're a North Dakota product. I mean, there, there's you don't go there by accident. It won't pitch you that way. Um, if you can pick up a guy with that raw talent on the roster. Um, that's always great. But again, I think the biggest knock on him potentially was the to play in the defensive zone was maybe the big question mark. And again, with St. Cloud, uh, especially this season, right? You have to look at the season by season. Excuse me. They're, um, the offense is going to be, um, so as to say, uh, not quite as potent as we've probably seen years past. And so, therefore, you need guys that are going to be defensively responsible, even as forwards. And you kind of wonder if that's the big knock on him. Does that mean he's a fit? Maybe, maybe not, because you still need guys that can put the puck in the net. Uh, that's for sure. But you're going to have to have a, a much better focus on your defensive end. And if that's the case, that's that might be risky. But We'll see. I don't know. He, he, I could see it. I could not. Sure. Sydney, want to know your thoughts on Ashton Calder. But also Nick mentioned a little bit about trying to drive that offense. That might come from the freshman group a little bit. After you talk about Ashton Calder, I'm kind of curious, who do you think maybe makes the jump to the Division One level, both on the forward and the back end, that's maybe going to be able to provide uh, what the Huskies need coming in in this new freshman class? Yeah, Ashton Calder, I definitely think is a, when I saw that name pop up, I definitely thought uh, it could be a possibility for St. Cloud State, just because I think, I'll tell you, I think it's going to be coming in in a minute here, but I think we do have room to pick up a forward still, uh, and I do think that he could possibly be one of those people we pick up, especially because he's just uh, going to be a fifth year, uh, so he's just got one year left. We're not picking up anybody for the long term, I don't think. I think we just want somebody who just has that extra year still. So I could definitely see that happening uh, just because there's not a ton of other forwards that I really think fit super great. There's still a couple NCHC players I could maybe see coming, but I definitely think we're going to want somebody who is going to be able to score some points uh, and put up some offense because there's a lot of forwards that uh, are in the portal who don't have a ton of offense. And I don't really think we'd be looking for that right now. Uh, just quickly on that center thing again, I do think we'll still pick up a center transfer just because right now for centers, we have Yami Kronola, great player, not an amazing center though, no. uh, especially on the face off dot. No, Ryan no. Roseboro, I think will play quite a bit this year. And then Salquist and Spellacy flip-flopped at center this year. I don't think they will both play center. I think one of them will play no. center and the other I think Spellacy might, again, just be in and out of the lineup. It sounds like he wanted to come back because he has a year left of his degree program, so why not also use that to play college hockey? I mean, that's awesome. So it sounded like that's what he was uh, planning on doing. So I could see, you know, if Salquist and Spellacy, if neither of them play center, we need two more centers uh, yeah. at least. And then if one of them plays center, because both of them I really – doubt will uh then we still need one so i think we'll pick one up yeah uh, because um, then for, moving for, over to for the, oh, yeah. for, the re for the record by the way st cloud losing both of their best centermen kevin fitzgerald and nolan yeah. walker last year for those who were curious so yeah uh just because then with our recruits for centers we only really have uh vd's brother Werner uh recruited but i don't really think he's going to come in next year i know some people thought maybe that was a possibility i don't really see him coming in next year plus vd is not a senior so if they want to play together they still got time uh and then martin's lavins who i don't think is ready to come in quite yet either uh for center so I think we'll pick up definitely a transfer at center. That's why I think possibly Crookshank or maybe somebody else, but you know, he's already played here. Uh, but like you said, taking a look kind of at our, at our recruits, I've watched most of them quite a bit uh, for our D core. We're losing what I assume is three D with Perbix, Jay Cox, since it was his fifth year uh, and then Donahue. And I think those will be replaced by Bushy's brother, uh, Evan Bushy. Uh, some people have heard this, but he's a lot different player. He's not a huge, big defensive defenseman like Brendan. Uh, he's a little bit smaller, but not a small guy, uh, but definitely puts up a lot more points. So that could be an interesting line. We could get a double Bushy line. Uh, <laughs> you never know, but I think he'll come in. And then our two 
recruits that will age out of juniors this year uh, are both from Waterloo uh, in the USHL. Uh, Cooper Wiley and Mason Reiners. Reiners is definitely more of a defensive defenseman. Uh, and then Cooper Wiley definitely has a little bit more points to him, but both are good players that I'm excited to see. So I'm not really sure how the defensive pairings will shape up quite yet, but I'm sure all the main people will be in there that you expect to be. But I think we'll bring in those three recruits on D. Uh, and then for forwards, I think the four players we're bringing in for freshmen will be Adam Ingram, who's had a crazy season this year in the USA. Yeah. Well, he's going to get drafted this summer. So watch out for that. I'm not really sure where he's going to get drafted yet, but he's been first overall, up, Sydney uh, uh-huh. on some lists. So I'm excited <laughs> for that. Another St. Cloud draft pick. That'll be awesome. Uh, and then I think we'll bring in uh, Ethan Alcoin and Jack Rogers. Again, they might be, I'm not sure how they're going to translate to the college game. They both had great seasons in their leagues. Uh, we'll have to see how they transition to college though. So not really sure quite yet what to expect out of them, but they have really good numbers. And then I think for the fourth forward we'll bring in will be Grant Ashan, which I'm sure we have, we've all heard that name plenty. Uh, it's another Ashan brother coming to St. Cloud State. He's not like Jack, though, so don't expect uh, that at all. He's definitely uh, taller. I think he's like 5'11", 5'10", so he's taller. Uh, he's a forward, and every year I've watched him in juniors, he's gotten better every single year. So I'm not sure if he would you know, play a ton right away, but I think he's got a lot of potential uh, just elevating his game every single year he's played. So I think we'll bring in those four forwards. And then I think possible, you know, spots that are left after all the people that have left the team this year, we still have spots for one forward and one center. uh, If you kind of take a look at who is playing those positions. So I think we'll hit the portal for a forward and a center. We'll bring in those four forwards. We'll bring in 3D. We already got Bassey in goal. Then we just have one more goalie. That's my take on the season. I know it's a lot of info, but that's what I'm pretty sure is going to happen for this next year. Yeah, certainly well done, Sydney. Uh, obviously, uh, thanking you for, for that. It gives a lot of us a good lay of the land here. Nick, I'm curious as to your thoughts. Do you like her picks? Do you think there's maybe a little bit different look that's going to come in addition or maybe subtraction from Sydney's picks? Or are there people that she mentioned that you're really excited to see in a Husky sweater? It's another Weibo babies, honestly. Oh yeah, you know, yeah, there's, pl- there's plenty of room. Uh, to me, the, the the two guys I'm ready to watch is Adam Ingram and Ethan Alcoin. Uh, you know, sort of the the new wave of offense. Uh, just looking at a couple, right? So Adam Ingram again on a Youngstown in the UASL, uh, 24 goals, 28 says 52 points in 51 games. So he's having a heck of a career. Uh, but Ethan Alcoin coming out of the Alberta Junior Hockey League, it's a league. So much of the BCHL, right? Where uh, at the end of it, it, it's a league that has produced, I think, the fourth most college, rec- you know, commits, uh, bes- you know, behind the USL, the NAL, and, co- and I'm trying to get the one of the league. I think it's the BC. The but NORPAC, about, clearly. The NORPAC, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> right, for the Lloyd Minster Bobcats, right, in 60 games, 36 goals, 27 assists, 63 points. Um, in the playoffs so far, five games, he's got seven assists and five games played. So this guy, uh, again, a lot more um, offensively gifted. So those are the two guys that I'm watching if they do make the jump. Because, again, whether it's a guy that doesn't impress you um, from juniors or whether it's a guy that is impressing you, there's always an adjustment, right? You know, we could have guys that maybe don't impress and somehow just something just something clicks and they figure it out at the college level. Or you get a high talented prospect and just nothing comes together, right? It's just so bizarre how when you make those jumps, the gap, are so large. And I think that's what people forget to realize sometimes is that the adjustment is not like taking one step up a stair. It's climbing a whole flight of steps. And the quicker that you can assimilate to it and get comfortable about it again, most of hockey players that are great, it's up here. It's all about the IQ. It's not about your foot speed. It's not about, you know, how quickly you can, you know, or how many times you can, uh, you know, lacrosse goal against a goal center. It's, you know, how can you think ahead of the game and think ahead of your your body? Um, and so, you know, with these two guys, they show that they have that skill set. They have the ability to finish. Uh, but how does it translate to the NCAAs? We'll have to see. But uh, those are the two guys that I'm really picking to watch for. Sure. I've only got two more questions that I really wanted to kind of talk about. The first is kind of a housekeeping one. I believe this goes back to COVID rules, but a couple people were asking. So I think we want to clarify a prime example is someone like Grant, Grant Cook, Grant Crookshank, who is getting ready to enter his second uh, transfer portal move in as many seasons, which normally you have to sit out a year for eligibility things. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, that that just comes down to the particular COVID rules for the group of guys that were in there, that they're able to make that move without 
a year of? You don't have to sit because there's so many players that are going to be doing it this year um, and they're sure. not going to sit out. So there's at least 10 probably double dippers. I don't know what our name is that we're going to call them, but there's there's quite a few players that have already transferred once that are going to transfer again this year. All right, perfect. Uh, the other question that I wanted to ask, and I'm going to start by answering my own question. I want to know each of you, I'll start with Sydney, then jump to Nick. I want to know each of you, one player that you feel on this St. Cloud State roster that is a returner that you feel is going to unlock their game next year. That's going to make that big jump. That's going to make that, you know, that next impact and kind of take their game to the next level. For me, it was a guy that you had kind of mentioned, had some consistency issues, but really has uh, continued to get better, I think, and I think will really grow in a forward role. That's Mason Solquist. And I think he had a rip roar and start to the beginning of last season, kind of fizzled out in the middle, found his game a little bit at the end, uh, you know, kind of approaching playoff time, but, you know, wasn't a huge factor. There's a guy where I think if he continues to get stronger, continues to build his strength in the offseason, and kind of does, we go back to him so many times, Yami Kranla, and his ability to uh, essentially from his freshman year to his sophomore year, take the raw skill or the raw tool set that he had and really put it all together into this, once again, we're going to say it, a buzzsaw package that was hardened on the forecheck, had a good mix of speed and skill, not too bad on the Michigan as well, mind you, and uh, has a cannon of a shot and able to contribute uh, around on special teams with his speed and size. So I'm really excited for Mason Solquist to see what he really jumps out to next year. I think I might already have Nick's already picked out, but I'm going to start with Sydney because I feel like I know who Nick's going to pick. Um, and I'm curious to see if I can get it right. But Sydney, yeah. let's see if you steal Nick's pick or if you have somebody else. Well, I got to say Solquist, yeah, good good choice. I loved Solquist this year. I thought he did a great job. I was really impressed by him. Uh, for me, I'll pick one forward and one D just to split it up. Um, so take that, Nick. Forward, <laughs> uh, forward, I got to go with Michael Miller just because he's Ooh, always okay. my favorite player. I feel like he never plays a bad game. Like, he's just good all the time. Uh, and I feel like because he's coming back for that fifth year, I think he feels like he can be one of the leaders on this team, especially in scoring, uh, in the interview he did with uh, Mick Hatton for the Rink Live, uh, talking about him wanting to return for next year, he really said, you know, I want to focus on getting getting more goals, and I think he can definitely do that. So I, I'm ready for him to have his, you know, best season yet, especially being one of the leaders uh, on this team for next year. Had and a then great, on, had a great year last year, by the way, I thought, yeah. especially defensively in special teams. So yeah, he's easily, you know, like our best penalty killer. He's just He's always awesome. I feel like I never really see him playing badly. Uh, so I'm really excited for him to come back. I think he's really going to take this fifth year seriously. I don't think he would have come back uh, if he didn't want to, because I can guarantee he probably had some offers uh, because he's just so such a great player. Uh, but on D, I'm going to actually have to go with uh, Josh Lidkey just because oh, I think he was my freshman of the year. I mean, he just seemed to work so hard all the time. Uh, and that's really nice to see for those freshmen, you know, even if he did make a mistake every now and then, you know, he would immediately make up for it. Like the play after that. And, you know, if he gave up the puck on a turnover, he'd immediately go and go and get it back right away. So I really liked him last year. I thought he was awesome on D. Uh, I'm not really sure who's, who he's going to be paired up with yet this year with a few new defensemen coming in, but I got to say Josh Lidke, and I think he's a guy, too, that might be wearing a C or an A in a few years, to be honest. He just seems like uh, a good guy, and I'm excited to see what he does for this next year. We are as well. Also, looking at the six defensemen that are currently on the roster, you have three real defensive defensemen, three more offensive defensemen, so you can maybe see three kind of identical pairings in, in that sort yeah. of pairing type, potentially. Nick Maxim. I believe is going to go with the defenseman. The safe pick for him is Jack Peart, but I honestly think he's going with Andre Trayball. That's my pick. And ah, man, you're going with the forward, aren't you? So let's let's do the Sid way. Let's pick one of each. Um, Don't Jack pick Peart, Jackson Caster. Come well, on, <laughs> he's, not, he's not either. So um, <laughs> Jack Peart is not the safe pick, but it, it's 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 different now he is going to be kind of the leader of the defensive core. Yeah. Um, you know, it, there's expectation with a second round pick in the NHL. Uh, I, I thought that he adapted well um, to the college game. I still feel like there's some things he's got to tweak in terms of uh, you're not going to be able to use the net and, and not skate around it. Um, we, I, I did notice one thing with Jack. He's not the greatest skater. Uh, he isn't. Um, he's got to work on that a little bit, but I do feel like his vision, his IQ is there. And I do feel like now he's probably going to be relied on uh, with Josh. I do feel like 
who does who does that sound like that maybe just left this program? All right, uh, Nick Perbix. Anyways, mm-hmm. so uh, I do feel like he's going to kind of be the one that's going to be you know sort of handed the keys to the defensive core. So I, I am kind of curious to see how Jack handles that responsibility um, on the back end. But to me, a forward. Yeah, keep me then. No. Ah, no, no, I, I've <laughs> lost faith in VD for a couple of reasons, actually. Ooh. Um, to me, VD is a six round pick and he's been showing it for the last couple of years. He's just he's a one trick pony, he's no, he's not much different than Easton Brozinski. Yeah, he really, he's got to get stronger pretty, pretty badly. Not only that, he's got to have the willingness to go actually go in and do and have a battle. I see him avoid yeah. contact more than I see him actually want to go in and even use your stick, right? You he don't need a little yeah. Jay Beagle in him, you know what I mean? It, yeah, right. So, <laughs> to when me, I see people ask if he's going to leave early, I'm like, if he left early now, he'd get demolished. Like, there's no way. There's let, no, let, no let's just put it to you this way. There's still question marks, although he's quite young, about Maddie Nyes making the jump to the Toronto Maple Leafs. So if there's question marks about a player like that, that has more to compare. do with Toronto than it is Maddie Nyes. But anyways, so, <laughs> so let's flip that script. To me, let me say it this way: my pick it forward. Um, I used to date somebody from Calgary, and uh, she, you know she was a fireball. Firebrand. If yeah, she, she was, and yeah. you know, at the end of the day. Zach Okabe to me yeah. is the guy, yes, that yeah. to me could really explode. He has all the tools um, to me to really take mm-hmm. on and really take control offensively for the squad. Um, skates very well. Instincts are there. He's not afraid to go in and, and get dirty and has won some battles. Again, he's not the biggest guy, but to me, he's got the drive. He's got the passion um, and he's got the skill. Uh, to me, he was the more consistent player on that line besides Yami. Uh, Vidi was sort of the ghost. I hate to say that, and I'm not trying to be nitpicking Vidi, but I'm kind of pissed off at Vidi right now, if you couldn't tell. Um, I feel like, you know, Vidi's game took a dive because, you know, people figured out, well, if you just take away time and space, he's not going to fight for his space. He's not, unless you're give him six feet around him in a bubble, he is almost, dare I say, useless. And dare I say mm-hmm. it? And, I, and that's a very strong word. And I get that, but yeah, in, invisible is a probably more appropriate word. Probably. Yeah. But you, you know, again, you didn't prove me wrong either way, honestly. Yeah. So uh, to me, VD is not the guy you look for. It is Zach Okabe. To me, he's the guy that is going to take that next step. And he's the guy that I think, um, will be kind of hand of the offensive mantle uh, when yeah. we go into next season. His past two seasons have looked really good, as well as Yami Cranola, two guys that have really kind of grown in their roles. Excited to see what Chase Brand obviously brings. Uh, Joey Molinar is another guy that I think could really find a good middle six or maybe third line role. You know, at- and can I lay a prediction out? Okay, how about this line to really unlock VD's potential? You need Rosboro with Okabe and VD. I think you have to split the fence. I really do. I agree. I don't really need them together anymore. I think they need somebody that's bigger on that well, line and somebody yes. that can do the battles for them because they need yes, that. They those two guys here's, are here's, or, or do you do Roseboro, Micah Miller, and VD Mietnan? Well, because uh, Micah Miller is so strong. I mean, he can battle like thing. four people off of him at one time. So I'm always so impressed yeah. by him and how, how well he can just skate through like five people like literally I, a whole team yeah I, I like i like your first selection the thing is is ryan rosborough ready for that and how good is he in the dot i mean those are your two we don't questions know. i think for that too but and what but what, what we do what other option do you have grant crookshank i don't know if grant is as <laughs> as tenacious as 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 that though he, he's also kind of a free space wheeling and dealing type forward too honestly and I the husky has announced that will hammer has yeah, returned also, really, for a fifth season also because grant crookshank isn't huge either like he's yeah decent he's size. a skill guy he's a skill 11 guy. but you he's know he's not going to be the big guy who's going to push people around because he's 5 11 187 you know that's not bad size but i mean it's not going to be a big guy that's going to push people around for you well, no. the, two, the two pieces that I'm really excited to see grow, I think this is finally the year that Dave Shayak really starts to bear down and add to his wine collection. He's got a good one already. I think he really <laughs> starts to increase. And I really think this is finally the season that Brett Larson finally gets over the public speaking hump and really becomes comfortable speaking in a locker room. I think this is finally his time uh, to take that over, of course. Um Anything else that you guys wanted to add about St. Cloud Hockey in the Minnesota Wild, uh, about Sid Wolf's Excel spreadsheet skill set? Uh, like, like, what do we got here? Can I get a hot take? Yeah, what do you got? St. Cloud will finish top four in the NCHC next year. Okay. I, don't okay. Think, that is, I think that I is a hot take, actually, a little bit. Because I'll agree with your hot take. They'll for sure finish top eight. 
Oh, really? <laughs> uh, here's why I say that if the pieces fall correctly, there's a there's a good enough foundation there that if you were able to if if the pieces come in, fit together well, if they could actually be kind of a sneaky, scary team, um, there's a lot that has to go right for that to happen. But I still feel like based on everybody else, I still feel like that they could be better. Yeah, I think I'm I'm going to add off of you and say, too, I don't think Miami and CC are ready to be top four yet for either of them. They're not ready to be also, top six. Also, with, with, the, with the, all the transfer portal people going in and out and people signing pro contracts, I'm not also feeling good about Nebraska-Omaha mm -hmm. next year, and no, I'm also no. not feeling good about Western Michigan next year. No, I'm not so either. I think Denver easily top four. Denver will win the NCHC next year. Denver's number one. Denver's North Dakota will be good. number two. Duluth and then St. Cloud. That's Duluth and us will be the same again, where we're back and forth from yeah. pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Duluth is really going to re rely on their goaltending and how Stayskull, uh, you know, is able to, um, you know, kind of carry that mantle too, and Duluth, you know, pieces with that as well. But yeah, St. Cloud is going to be an interesting piece, and I think that obviously the transfer portal, really, the next month or two, I think, is really going to kind of figure out a lot of things for this Huskies team. Uh, and if the transfer portal is a uh, make or break thing for this group, because I think it really has the potential to be, I don't think it has the potential to be in a real negative way. I think it's a, it, the transfer portal uh, really has more positive upside than it did entering last year. You know what I mean? Cause I think well, Jared Cockrell was a big reason why wins the yeah. national championship game. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I think that, you know, trying to re to replace him with another player uh, and obviously Jared, of course, was a winger primarily. But, uh, you know, trying to replace him with another player that played with that identity was a little bit more of a challenge versus this year. They are looking for a guy that maybe fits the mold anywhere in the lineup a little bit more just because of the fact that they could use offense at every depth level on that forward group, I think. But uh, it's going to be intriguing to see who kind of makes that opening night roster, who's going to be the starting goaltender, all those things we're going to have to obviously hash it out. Uh, so next, that was next hot take. Sydney, do you have anything uh, crazy that you're about to blow our mind with well, here? Well, I don't know if I have any hot takes. I do think we'll be top four just because those teams I mentioned too are going to have a lot to deal with. I mean, Western doesn't even have a goalie right now and Nebraska <laughs> Omaha also had a huge exodus of signings and portal players and crazy stuff obviously they could get really good too if they have random chemistry with you know portal players or freshmen next year but yeah I'll agree with that hot take I think we're going to be top four again just because you know we'll have a lot of new players but our decor is going to be pretty similar for the most part we're losing a couple people but got a lot of the same people too we'll have to see how goaltending shakes out I don't know. I don't know if I have any hot takes quite yet. I think they need to stew a little bit over the summer before I get any well thought out ones. Come on, Caleb, give us it all right now. <laughs> I guess uh, I think it's funny how she just casually, you know, Western Michigan doesn't even have a goalie. Oh, is that important? Oh, I guess too. Uh, for a hot take that's not even in our conference, we were talking about this a little before the show. St. Thomas, watch out for St. Yes. Thomas next yes. year. We have got yes. some insane recruits. Uh, yeah, we, to, we, we talked about St. Cloud and the Norseman. Ryan O'Neill is an absolute stud. They've what got some great... good USL, USHL commits too. So honestly, anybody that's thinking St. Thomas is going to be an easy game next year, think again. They, think how about again. this? They're top 20 next year. Well, it's going to be that's hot take because they can't compete in the in the tournament for, what is it, four more years? Four more years. So they can still have a really good season, though. So They're going to give the committee something promise, to think about. <laughs> you better what, an, what, an, what, an, what an odd rule that is. It's yeah, very it's odd. Kind of weird. Um, but, you know, and it's, it's two like, things, right, Sid? Because for St. Thomas, not only do you have good recruits, but you, you gave the D3 guys that they could have just cast aside. He let them play, and they still gave Mankato fits in the CCHA, right? Yeah, they still actually finished up their season pretty decent. Really good. Really good. So, really, really curious to see where Minnesota State kind of moves next year, by the way, too. It's going to be an interesting, although – Starting net miner might be former Minotauros goaltender Keena Rancier. So uh, in yeah, good hands, sure. potentially. You know, here's I, – I think it's funny. We talk about growing the game so much. Oh, but by the way, you can't play in the tournament for X number of – I think years. that's honestly just so that they don't just get a ton of superstar players that want to play on this team Open for recruiting. one year. It's a, you know, it's a recruiting yeah. thing, yeah. It'd just, be, it'd just be too weird if you did that. You'd get a team full of superstars Sp for one Especially year. with the deep pocketbooks that St. Thomas had. They could easily buy yeah, their way. They yeah, could, they yeah, could just get yeah. a superstar team for one year. So I kind of get it, but five years kind of does seem like one. Might be kind of fun, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>
Because they could be like Toronto 2.0 where they get all the, then all of a sudden they just botch in the first round anyway. So you mean a conservative sport breaking the norm? Come on, Nick. I that's, know. What that's the heck? crazy. Speaking of breaking the norm, we're going to suspend our action for tonight. Speaking of suspensions, Evgeny Malkin hot off the press suspended four, four games. games for cross Should have been more. Should have been more. For cross checking Nashville Predators, Mark Borowiecki. Um, so yeah interesting but we're going to suspend our action uh, again much appreciated time thank you sydney wolf for uh um hanging out with us losers and uh yeah giving us i'm a the chance. only loser no not you <laughs> give it giving us the chance to he said it not me i'm just over here um uh, for giving us a chance to kind of pick your brain about all things college hockey, like Sydney had kind of mentioned, check out her on Twitter at Sydney is a wolf, still one of the bash hashtags of all time or Twitter handles, I should say, uh, doing a fantastic job with all of her work at the rink live. Of course, you can find Nick Maxson as well as myself on Twitter and us at the warming house den. That will do it for episode number 107, episode 108, currently slated for a Sunday release, although we'll keep you updated. Find us at warming house den. We'll give you an update if that changes. Then we're going to take a week off on April 24th through the end of the month. And then May 1st, we're back to talk all things uh, NHL playoff action. Hopefully the Minnesota Wild, all, uh, as we normally do, Nick, I almost forgot to do it. We do usually let people know what the Minnesota Wild are up to, considering they are the main bread and butter right now that we're going to be following from here on out. He's looking at you look so confused right now. Um, <laughs> you went from exodusing to reeling it back. What what the what the heck's going on here? Final things. Minnesota's at home against Edmonton when this comes out on Tuesday, in Dallas on Thursday, in St. Louis on Saturday, hosting San Jose on Sunday, and finishing out with Montreal, Vancouver, Seattle, Nashville, Arizona, Calgary, and Colorado. So pay attention to the Minnesota Wild. They're very good at hockey, and we will see you next week for episode number 108. And your one-timer coming, they score! Fires and she scores! Dana Rasmussen for the Huskies alongside. Dwayne Kaprizov in for a chance to win it. He scores! Kirill the thrill is for real! Welcome to the NHL, a game winner. St. Cloud Cathedral is now 42.6 seconds away from wrapping up the school's first ever title.